Jesus said, If I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? What's Jesus just said? He said that if I have told you of earthly things, things you can test, study, and observe, things that you can hold in your hands, and you won't even believe those things, how in the world are you going to believe in the heavenly things, the spiritual things? The Bible is the lens through which people can correctly view the world that we live in. Now, the Bible is not a science book, but it's the true history book of the universe. So how biblical accounts that can be tested today scientifically, such as uh, do kinds only bring forth after their kind? Uh, when did death enter the world? Is Earth billions of years old, or did it get judged by a global flood that laid down strata layers? How the biblical accounts stand up to observable facts will greatly influence whether or not a person gives their life to God, to the biblical Jesus. It, it will influence whether people see God's word as being authoritative and reliable for guiding their lives or not. Uh, a key attack on people's faith in God's Word over the past 200 years, and this really only became popular about 150 years ago, is how old is the earth? One of the pillars of old earth beliefs has been Grand Canyon, and I like to take people to Grand Canyon. We do Grand Canyon rim tours, have since 2006, and grand staircase tours that show people the authority and truth of God's Word right here in the world that we live in, recapturing these secular bastions for God's glory. Everyone's taught, and has been, uh, in public schools and colleges and national parks and museums and, and uh, National Geographic, etc., that over millions of years of time, the Colorado River has carved out Grand Canyon. Well, real science, a believer's best friend, has proven that's not true. Let's talk about the Grand Canyon now. You know, a key question is how long did it take to form Grand Canyon? In Proverbs 18, we're told, He that answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame to him. In other words, hey, let's open up our minds and let's look at some evidence, and then you can decide what you want to believe about Grand Canyon and how long it took to form. I like to call this message the six-day formation of Grand Canyon. In 2 Peter 3, it's foretold that there shall come in the last days scoffers, and they're going to claim that all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Well, this is a key concept for old earth beliefs today. It's called, here's a big word, uniformitarianism. That sounds scary, it just means uniformity. The processes occurring today are relatively the same as they've always been since the beginning of the creation, as prophesied in 2 Peter 3. Uniformity. For instance, they look at the amount of sediments being taken out by the Colorado River out of uh, what is today Grand Canyon, and they can say, hey, it's always been the same uh, rate of erosion. It took millions of years to form the canyon. Uniformity. Well, let's talk about what a faulty theory uniformity is. Have you ever seen someone drain the oil out of a car? You pull the plug out of the bottom and bush, the oil pours into the pan below. But if you came along an hour later and you'd never seen oil drain from a car, you could measure the amount of oil in the pan and you could observe it's one drop per hour and you might conclude it took millions of years to fill that a pan with oil. But you'd be absolutely wrong. Things happen quickly, like the laying down of the strata layers and the formation of Grand Canyon, and today's rates are not as they've always been in the past. Well, Second Peter goes on with their end-time prophecy to state that these scoffers are going to be willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. The Bible foretells that in the last days, people are going to deny the global flood. Now, well, why in the world would you deny the global flood? Well, whether you realize it or not, and I explain this in our Old Earth or a Global Flood message quite clearly, anyone's belief in the age of the Earth actually comes down to how the Earth's sedimentary layers laid down by water that make up the crust of the Earth form. Old Earth beliefs are all derived on the belief that the Earth's sedimentary layers that were laid down by water form slowly in a uniform process over long ages of time, uniformity. 
Therefore, a global flood would explain how the layers form quickly, wiping out every Old Earth belief that put death before Adam. And the Grand Canyon and Grand Staircase are undeniable proof of the truth and the authority of God's Word. And I'll explain the Grand Staircase here in just a moment. First of all, let's go to Grand Canyon. You know, we're taught that Grand Canyon strata layers and the chasm itself formed over millions of years of time. Well, since science is knowledge derived from the observation and study of testable evidence, who saw the canyon uh, layers form over millions of years of time, or who saw the gorge itself form slowly over millions of years? Nobody. Those are beliefs. Those are interpretations based on a faulty starting position of uniformitarianism. You see, the study of Grand Canyon, it's never been about the evidence about the canyon or the strata layers, because think about it, everybody has the exact same evidence to test, study, and observe. The study of Grand Canyon is about the, the, the worldview, the philosophical framework through which those evidences get interpreted. And since secular humanists have owned the system now for a hundred plus years, everything gets interpreted through their belief, which is long ages of death and suffering before man came along. For instance, in secular textbooks, kids are taught that strata layers form over millions of years of time. Now, once again, I must ask, who saw strata layers form over millions of years of time? Nobody. That's a belief. It's not a scientific fact. And again, it's based on uniformitarianism. Uniformity. The thing and processes continue as they've been since the beginning of the creation. Tell you what, since things don't always continue the same, we have catastrophic events around the globe. Even secular geologists are now having to admit that. So the evidence is overwhelming. Let's go to Mount St. Helens in the state of Washington and show you some evidence of things forming quickly. The volcano erupted on May 18, 1980. Mount St. Helens erupted with the force of one World War II atomic bomb blast per second. 60 seconds per minute. 60 minutes per hour for nine straight hours. Talk about power. Think about this. This was just a relatively small volcano. Well, millions of tons of ash and debris were vaulted into the atmosphere. Three separate events at Mount St. Helens showed us how strata layers, finely stratified layers, can be laid down in a matter of minutes in three different ways just at the volcano. The airfall deposits of following pyroclastic flow from within the volcano and later mud flows all laid down up to a total of 600 feet of finely stratified layers each in a matter of minutes not never seen millions of years of time. Well, there are many evidences at Grand Canyon that the strata through which the canyon cuts were laid down quickly. For instance, all the layers contain marine fossils indicating they were laid down quickly in water, not slowly over millions of years of time. Clams, nautiloid, jellyfish, starfish, brachiopods, sponges, and more are found throughout those sedimentary layers laid down by water. Shrinkage cracks are a problem for old earth beliefs at Grand Canyon. You've seen where a mud puddle dries and the, the layer of mud cracks as it shrinks. Those are called shrinkage cracks. Well, upper exposed layers, top layers at the canyon that were then buried supposedly by the old earth standards millions of years later, have shrinkage cracks in the top exposed part of the layer that not only go down into the layer but up into the new layer above, proving that the upper layer was laid down on top of it before the lower layer even had time to dry. There are no time gaps between the various layers at Grand Canyon. The layers are laid down one right on top of the other. That's the reason you have the straight horizontal uh, contact points or lines between them. There's no evidence of, of weathering or erosion. If a layer laid exposed for millions of years of time, you'd have rain erosion forming channels and washes and gullies. You'd have wind erosion. You'd have plants growing onto that top layer. You'd have rocks leaching acids into the top layer and the soil thereof. 
but those are not found. Those would be time gaps. But the layers of Grand Canyon were laid down one on top of the other very quickly. You know, at Grand Canyon on our rim tours, I can show you original creation rock. You can see it down in the bottom of the gorge. It's the non-stratified igneous rock. The Zorister granites and the various schists in the bottom of the canyon are not stratified. That's original creation rock formed during the week of creation. And you can see it clearly in this picture. There is creation rock. I can take you on the rim where you can actually touch the original creation rock. The old earthers have another problem at Grand Canyon where the, the first of the flood layers, the lowest layer at Grand Canyon is the Pete Sandstone, the lowest flood layer, sits on top of the creation rock. They have a problem. They're missing up to 1.2 billion years of supposed layers that were supposed to be between the creation rock and the first of the flood layers, the Pete Sandstone at Grand Canyon. They call it the Great Unconformity, where somehow some erosional event supposedly eroded their 1.2 billion years of strata. Actually, in real science, there's a principle called Occam's Razor that the simplest explanation is usually by far the best. And the best explanation is those 1.2 billion years of layers never were there. The, the flood was laying down layers and picking them up. This is what stratified the layers and they rushed in, laid down the peat sandstone on top of the granites and the schists, uh, and there never was 1.2 billion years of time missing in between the two. The Great Unconformity, a problem for old Earth beliefs. Let's take a short video break and talk about creation rock seen from the rim of Grand Canyon. Hi, my name is Russ Miller of Creation and Evolution and Science Ministries, and right behind me in the bottom of Grand Canyon, you're actually looking down into the basement rock, which is the uh, Zorister granite and the various schists, and we consider that to be the original creation rock made during the creation week. During the flood, the topsoil was scoured off and has been redeposited in the sedimentary layers laid down by water that we see. But in the bottom, you can see the, the jumble pink and dark granite and schist. And right up on top, you see the first cliff, the sedimentary layers. That's the Tapete sandstone. And that is the first of what I call the judgment layers you see in the bottom of Grand Canyon. They're all sedimentary layers from there to the top of the rim, all laid down by water. Well, anyways, at the point of contact between the original creation rock and the Tapete sandstone, the old earth geologists are missing 1.2, I should say up to 1.2 billion years of strata layers. They try to explain, well, somehow they got removed. Well, I think the better explanation is they were never there to begin with. The flood was laying down layers and picking them up. This stratified out the layers. And right below me, you're actually looking at rock from the original week of creation, the original creation rock, the schists and the granites. The Coconino Sandstone is one of the pillars of Old Earth beliefs. If I speak on a college campus somewhere about the age of the Earth, someone is most assuredly going to raise their hand and say, well, how do you explain the Coconino Sandstone at Grand Canyon? To which I always say, very well, thanks for asking. Secular geology has taught for 100 plus years that the Coconino layer, the Coconino Sandstone, which is the third layer down from the top at Grand Canyon, uh, formed in dry desert conditions over millions of years of time. Of course, nobody saw that take place, that's a belief, uh, but it's what's been taught and it is one of the pillars of Old Earth beliefs today. However, there are many problems for the Coconino Sandstone having formed in deserts slowly over long ages of time. For instance, the Coconino layer contains what are called cross-bedded sand dunes. Well, secular geology again teaches these are uh, desert form dunes. However, sand dunes can form in dry deserts or they can also form in underwater sand deposits. The angle of the slope of those cross bedded sandstones tells the tale. The sand is moved along either by wind or underwater and forms a slope and the sand falls off the back of the slope laying down the cross bedded sandstones. 
Well, the angle of inclination of those cross beds tells us whether they formed under water or in dry desert conditions. In deserts, the angle of inclination is generally from 24 to 36 degrees. Under water, they go from 18 to 24 degrees. The layers, uh, the cross beds in the Coconino, average about 22 degrees, proving they formed under water. Amphibian tracks are found in those cross bedded sandstones, always going uphill or at an angle uphill. Now, what are we supposed to believe if they form in dry deserts? Amphibians can only go uphill. Now, that wouldn't make any sense. They leave their little nest in the morning, go uphill, and they, they have to go all the way around the world to get home again. Come on, that doesn't make any sense, does it? What happened was the, the amphibian got washed over the forming dune and dropped down off the edge where those cross beds are forming. So he's at the bottom of the cross bed, and he has to crawl uphill or at an angle uphill to get out of the water, and he gets washed back down by, as he gets to the top, the moving sand buries his tracks quickly, preserving them so they'll be found fossilized, always going uphill or at an angle uphill. Then the poor little creature has to go uphill again to get out, and he's continually going uphill, getting pushed back down, going uphill, getting pushed back down as the sands are burying his tracks quickly, preserving them to be found fossilized, always going uphill or at an angle uphill. The Coconino sandstone also contains angular grains of sand. Well, think about this for a minute. Desert dunes are made of sand grains that get tumbled along in the wind, and they're rounded off, like, like river rock tends to get rounded. However, when the grains of sand are found in underwater dunes, they get very quickly, and they're very angular. They're not rounded off. They have sharp edges to them if you look at them through a microscope. Well, the grains of sand in the Coconino are angular, proving they formed underwater. Recently, dolomite was found in the Coconino layer, and dolomite is associated with layers that form underwater. Then you have what's called homogeneous injectiles found in the bottom of the Coconino that shoot into the hermit shale below. Well, what in the world is a homogeneous injectile? Well, the old earth interpretation is the hermit shale formed over millions of years, and then the coconino formed over millions of years, the tapetes and the kaibab limestone formed over millions of years on top of the coconino. However, there was a fault called the Bright Angel Fault that actually caused a fault to take place, and it wasn't my fault, it was, it was God's fault, you're going to blame somebody, but the fault shot uh, through these various layers. Well, when this event took place, supposedly tens of millions of years after the Coconino had formed and hardened into rock, the Coconino was still liquefied and shot liquefied injections of sandstone into the hermit shale below, for proving all the layers were laid down quickly, not slowly over millions of years of time. Here's another short video about the Coconino sandstone. Hi, my name is Russ Miller of Creation and Evolution and Science Ministries. I'm standing on the south rim of Grand Canyon on the Kaibab Limestone. Now the third layer down is that big white band across from us. That's the Coconino Sandstone. It's about 300 feet thick here, and it's actually claimed to be one of the great proofs of millions of years' beliefs. Old Earth geologists are taught that this formed in dry desert conditions over, of course, millions of years of time. But there are actually many evidences found in the Coconino sandstone that prove it formed underwater, not in dry desert conditions. For instance, lines of parting lineation are found in the Coconino. <laughs> what in the world is that? Simply current marks. Current marks are found in the Coconino sandstone. And current marks are only found in layers that form underwater, not in desert conditions. Also, dolomite has been found recently, and dolomite found in the Coconino is associated with layers that form underwater, not in dry desert conditions. So once again, another old earth belief bites the dust. Sponge and coral reefs found in the Redwall limestone are claimed to be proofs of millions of years of time. Now, the Old Earth interpretation of the Red Wall Limestone, which is about halfway down the canyon, uh, and it's anywhere from 400 to, to 700 feet thick on average, this is claimed to be proof that they formed in, in calm seas, 
over long ages of time. And I've got to admit that sponge reefs and coral reefs in the red wall would prove it took a long time to form. However, look at this from the Colorado Geological Society. Coral reefs are not known from the red wall. Hmm. This from Grand Canyon Geology. Sponge reefs have not been documented in the red wall limestone. So they claim that coral and sponge reefs prove that the red wall formed over long ages of time in, in calm, tranquil seas. They just forget to point out that never have coral reefs or sponge reefs been documented in the red wall limestone. Now they do find pieces of coral and pieces of sponge because those layers were laid down in, in aqueous conditions. They do find marine creatures, but they don't find these supposed reefs that grew in place. Crinoids are sea lilies, and the crinoid head is very delicate. Yet we find fossilized crinoid heads in the red wall. This demands that the, the entire layer form quickly before they could uh, dissolve or rot away. Here's a, another short video about the Redwall Limestone in Grand Canyon. Hi, my name is Russ Miller of Creation and Evolution and Science Ministries. I just wanted to point out the Redwall Limestone, which is a 900-foot layer of limestone. The Old Earth interpretations is it formed slowly over never seen millions of years of time in calm, tranquil seas. However, what's been discovered in the lower section of the red wall, about 25 to 30 feet above the bottom, is a seven foot layer that runs through the red wall limestone from uh, west of Las Vegas, to the eastern edge of the Painted Desert. And in this seven foot layer in the bottom of the red wall are billions of what they call nautiloids, which are uh, squid like creatures with long conical shells. And they were laid down oriented in the same direction, proving they formed in fast moving muddy, silty water, not slow, calm seas over long ages of time. Anyways, the red wall limestone, great proof of flooding on a catastrophic global uh, level. Nautiloids are extinct sea creatures. They were somewhat like a squid and they had a long conical shell that was shaped uh, something uh, like, a, like a cigar. And these have been found in the red wall limestone in a certain layer uh, that can be in an inch to, to five feet in length. The interesting thing is this layer that contains them is about oh, 25 to 30 feet above the bottom of the red wall and it's a layer about seven feet thick that runs from the uh, eastern edge of Painted Desert through the western edge of Las Vegas. There's an estimated five billion nautiloids laid down in this layer the interesting thing is they're oriented facing generally the same direction, which means that whole layer was laid down in running sludge very quickly, and it deposited those already drowned and killed nautiloids very quickly, not slowly, over millions of years of time. Microscopic spheres of polonium are found. Now, when polonium forms, and there's different types of polonium, but polonium-210, for instance, when it forms, it gives off a burst of energy. Now these are microscopic in size, but picture a big firework going off in the sky. It gives off that burst of energy. Well, the polonium-210 gives off that energy for about two years from the time it starts to form. Now if it gets captured in a rock that hardens or a, or a log that petrifies, while it's giving off the burst of energy, it forms what they call radio halos. Here's a picture right here from Robert Gentry. Now, those halos would be gone after a two-year period of time, but they've been found in various petrified logs on the Colorado Plateau and in different layers, proving the layers were all formed within a two-year period of time and hardened within that period of time as well. Some of these halos were found that were squished while they were forming. If you look at this picture from Robert Gentry, you'll see these elliptical halos. You can see the darker part where the, the round had formed and the layer above was laid down and it squished that forming halo. You know it's within that two year period because it then started to form the round sphere again as you can see in this, in this photo. And now these elliptical squished halos that then continued forming the round halo are found in the Triassic, Eocene, and the Jurassic period uh, uh, layers at Grand Canyon, proving 
those three layers were laid down in less than two years of time, not over a quarter of a billion years like secular geology erroneously teaches. Uranium decays into lead. It's one of the radiometric dating techniques. And I cover these in our Old Earth Global Flood teaching. But petrified logs in the Colorado reveal lots of uranium, but very little lead, showing they haven't had, the uranium hasn't had that much time to decay. Now, if you were using the radiometric or radioisotope dating assumptions, that would prove that the logs and the strata layers are only a few thousand years old. From Romans 1.20, we're told, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, so that they, who they, the ones that do not believe in our biblical creator and savior, are going to be without excuse when they stand before him. But the fact of the matter is that Grand Canyon strata testify to God's global flood judgment by water. Now, absolute proof of global flooding is found at Grand Canyon. God left a couple of 900-foot remnants of strata layers above the rim of Grand Canyon. These 900-foot layers are made up of the Chinle layer, the bottom, uh, and the Monkopi mudstones. The Monkopi mudstones are the bottom 600 feet, the Chinle layer the top 300 feet. This is Red Butte. It stands above the Kaibab limestone, which makes up the rim of the canyon. It's above that, and it's about 15 miles south of Grand Canyon. If you go to Grand Canyon up through Williams, and you go through Tucson, where the IMAX is, you've seen Red Butte. Red Butte's just a mile to the east of Highway 64, about five miles south of Tucson. It's 900 feet tall, the Monkopi and Chinle layers. Yet that 900-foot layer has been removed for tens of thousands of square miles, except for its sister butte. That's me standing at the eastern edge of the south rim of Grand Canyon uh, by desert viewpoint. I like to bring in people uh, through Cameron from the east and do this talk on the rim. And there's Cedar Butte behind me. It's the sister butte of Red Butte. Again, 900 feet, the, the 600-foot Monkopi mudstones and the 300-foot Chinle layer on top of it. These 900-foot layers have been removed from above the rim of Grand Canyon. Where we're standing there on the rim, those layers used to be 900 feet on top of where we're standing, removed for tens of thousands of square miles. Now, I like to ask people, once I've explained that, do you understand how that missing 900-foot of strata is undeniable proof of the global flood? And by that time, because everyone's seen our Old Earth Global Flood teaching as we drive up from Flagstaff on the, on the luxury bus, and people say, oh, that's awesome proof of the flood, because I like to point out, well, that's great, you understand that, but that 900-foot layer is nothing. There used to be over a mile of strata on top of it. If you've been to Grand Canyon, when you stand on the rim, there used to be a mile and a half of layers above what is now the rim of the canyon, and they've been removed for tens of thousands of square miles. And there's no way to explain that but Global Flood, which was laying down layers and picking them up, and the last time they were running off of the continents, the floodwaters eroded that mile and a half of strata, leaving behind what is geologically known as the Grand Staircase. If you go north of Grand Canyon, and from Desert View, you can see the first major step of the Million Cliffs, about 65 miles in the distance. What we think happened to form the Grand Staircase, and there are developing theories, because we weren't there to test, study, and observe this, was that late flood waters were rushing across what is now the North American continent, heading in an easterly direction, and they eroded that mile and a half of strata in the Grand Staircase. If you go 60 miles north of Grand Canyon, you'll come to the Vermilion Cliffs, which are about a 2,000 foot high step of the Grand Staircase. Now, on top of those 2,000 feet, if you go about 40 miles north, you come to the 2,500-foot gray and white cliffs of Zion. Now, if you go on top of those layers and about 40 more miles north, you'll come to the 2,500-foot step known as the Pink Cliffs, which include the Bryce Canyon area. That's the Grand Staircase. 
There's actually some chocolate cliffs, the vermilion cliffs, the gray and the white cliffs of Zion, and the pink cliffs of Bryce. From Bryce south in the Grand Staircase, that mile and a half of strata has been removed for tens of thousands of square miles. Bryce Canyon is not actually a canyon at all. It's actually located off the edge of a plateau. It's actually a sapping structure. If you've ever walked along the edge of a river where the water leaves the area and, and comes out from underneath the edge, the edge of the river bank collapses straight down. You see those little bowl-shaped cuts where it just drops straight down? That's a sapping structure. And if you look at Bryce Canyon, you'll see it's actually a sapping structure. It didn't form over long ages of time as they teach at Bryce Canyon. In fact, the, the photo here actually shows some of the sapping structures along the rim of Grand Canyon. For instance, if you're at Bryce, look at those what they call hoodoos. Those are those pink formations. It's a gorgeous area. And the story you're going to be told is over, of course, long ages of time. Water and condensation slowly get in the cracks of the rock. It freezes and expands, cracking the rock. And this goes on and on and on and on till the rock falls away, leaving behind those structures that we call hoodoos. Well, there's a couple of problems for that. First of all, look at even at this picture, but get on the edge of Bryce and look down, and you'll find that there's no rock debris there. The floor of the, of the sapping structure is clean as a whistle. If rock is falling off of those hoodoos, wouldn't it be piled up at the base of the hoodoo? <laughs> the lack of rock debris shows this form quickly, not slowly over never observed millions of years of time. Here's a short video of me explaining Grand Staircase. It's filmed at Lee's Ferry, which is at the base of the Vermilion Cliffs, one of the major steps of the Grand Staircase. So I'm standing at Lee's Ferry in northern Arizona at Marble Canyon. This is where the river raft trips are launched that head through Grand Canyon. And we're standing in front of the Vermilion Cliffs. We're at the base of the Vermilion Cliffs. This is a 2,000 to 2,500 foot step of the Grand Staircase. We've just gotten through a rafting trip from Glen Canyon Dam to Lee's Ferry, which cuts through those massive layers of rock, strata. They were laid down by water. Now as we get to Lee's Ferry, suddenly the whole area opens up and these massive rock layers behind us have been removed for tens of thousands of square miles. I would ask you to ask yourself, when you look at that massive strata layer, those vertical rock walls, how in the world, what power could have removed these rock layers for tens of thousands of square miles. And when you realize that there used to be 6,000 or so feet of additional rock layers on top of these layers, which you pick up at the gray and white cliffs of Zion and the pink cliffs of Bryce, there is a mile of missing strata here. Ask yourself, what force could have possibly have removed them and cut the steps in vertical cliffs? I would have to say the only viable explanation is the worldwide global flood, which removed those layers the last time they ran off after the mountains arose and the valley sank down. The last time those waters rushed off the continents, they eroded that mile of strata in the grand staircase. And here we stand in front of some of the most awesome proof of the truth and reliability and authority of God's word. So again, the grand staircase awesome proof of the truth of God's word and the global flood which wipe out every old earth belief that put death before Adam. My friends, we can, we can just read God's word and believe God's word. The Grand Staircase. And we lead not only our one and two day rim trips to Grand Canyon, we also lead four and five day Grand Staircase tours where we spend a day at Grand Canyon, a day river rafting, one day at Zion, and one day at Bryce. It, these are awesome Christian trips. Please visit my website at creationministries.org and look under uh, Christian Travel and Tours 
and get on the bus with us. These are great Christian adventures. And Grand Canyon and Grand Staircase are monuments to God's past and coming judgments of sin. We need to be ready for them. Now, if you think you can't believe in the biblical, what they call young earth creation, I don't like the term young earth myself, I think uh, earth six to 10,000 years old is, is pretty ancient actually, but you know, if you want to be scientific, and I'm all for you being scientific, the geological uh, names for the periods of time, they're important to have a reference of study. The only difference between the old earth beliefs and the biblical belief is how long did it take the various layers to form and what event caused them to form. Well, what about the canyon itself? We've talked about strata layers. Uh, how did Grand Canyon form? Well, secular geology teaches the Grand Canyon was dug out by the Colorado River over never seen millions of years of time. Again, this is based on uniformity thinking. But let me ask you an obvious question. If rivers carve out huge canyons over millions of years of time, and if the earth is billions of years old, then why isn't every river, gully, stream, and creek in its own Grand Canyon by now? Why aren't there millions of Grand Canyons around the globe? The fact of the matter is, Grand Canyon formed due to a series of very unique circumstances. This is a satellite photo of Grand Canyon. Uh, the white is snow. It's on the Kaibab Upward. Now, that top layer, the brown and the white layer, is the Kaibab Limestone, but the Colorado Plateau was uplifted, forming what's called the Kaibab Upward, where the limestone was lifted 3,500 3, to 4,500 feet above the plain. So in the satellite photo, you see the snow on the uplifted Upward, but not on the plain that was not uplifted. If you look at this picture, you'll see that the north rim of the canyon is 8,500 feet in elevation, but where the river enters the canyon, it's only at 2,800 feet elevation. In other words, the top of the rim, above, on the top of the Kaibab Upwork, is over a mile above the river. But water doesn't flow uphill. So, for the last 150 years, secular geologists have been taught the ancient river or antecedent river theory. Now, this has been totally debunked, and nobody that I know teaches this today. It's been pretty well thrown into the dustbin of history over the last 10 years. However, most people think this is how it formed because that's what they were taught when they were in school. But this, the ancient river theory is that the Colorado River was eroding through the upwarp at the exact same rate that the upwarp was forming to get over the fact that the water would have had to run uphill to get over the upwork. Well, this, like I say, has been completely debunked. There were many flaws with it. For instance, no one has ever found the ancient riverbed of the supposed ancient Colorado River. It doesn't exist. A symposium of geologists reviewed the ancient river theory and unanimously rejected it, and this was back in 1964. And just in the last 10 years have they finally stopped teaching this erroneous fairy tale. So they had to come up with a way to replace this without admitting that the canyon formed quickly because keep in mind Grand Canyon is one of the four pillars of old earth beliefs. There's Grand Canyon, dinosaurs, which I cover in our Noah's Ark and Dinosaur Teaching, the radiometric dating techniques, and the geologic column, which I cover in our in Old Earth Global Flood message. And I'd really suggest you see the Old Earth Global Flood message if Age of the Earth issues uh, is a question mark or a stumbling block for you. So to try to come up with a way to explain how the canyon formed over long ages of time, they came up with the stream capture or precocious gully theory. And this basically says that a gully eroded Grand Canyon in about five million years of time. That there was a erosional event, a gully coming from one direction, and it finally hooked up with where the Colorado River was carving out through the upwork and they came together in the stream capture. It captured the Colorado River, captured it forming, uh, completing the Grand Canyon we see today. Well, there's a lot of problems uh, with the stream capture theory. For instance, there's a notorious lack of Colorado River sediments in the west and in the east. In other words, the missing 908 or so cubic miles of missing sediments that have been removed from the gorge 
They're not along the edge of the Colorado River or down in the Gulf, which is where they'd be if, if the river carved out the canyon slowly. Also, I lead river raft trips that go through Grand Canyon, and, and the place where they supposedly come together, the erosional vent, the gorge, and then the, the Colorado River met in the stream capture. First of all, as you're going along about a two-mile straight stretch of river, and the walls on one side are 700 feet straight up and down, indicative of very fast formation, there's no one spot you can say, here's where the two erosional vents met, and where the Colorado River used to supposedly turn off, it's digging this 700-foot cliff here, and it turns off into slow meandering cliffs at Kanab Creek. That doesn't make any sense. Huge problems for the stream capture theory. I think most secular uh, and secular geologists have abandoned it as well, leaving them with no viable theory on how the canyon could have formed slowly. That's important to note. The old earthers do not have a viable theory on how the canyon could have formed slowly. And just common sense, stand on the edge of the canyon and ask yourself, a gully did this? That <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Let's go back to Mount St. Helens where God showed us how things happen catastrophically and suddenly, not slowly over uniform long ages of time. At the start of the eruption, the north slope of the mountain slid into the Toodle Valley below, damming up the Toodle River. Over a two-year period of time, a huge lake formed behind that earthen dam. And then, on March 19, 1982, the waters breached that earthen dam. Well, when water breaches an earthen dam, it causes it to collapse catastrophically by a massive water and debris flow. And five complete canyon systems, side canyons and all, were formed in a matter of hours at Mount St. Helens. Here's a canyon that's over 1,000 feet wide. 160 feet deep and more than two miles long, formed quickly by a massive water and mud flow at Mount St. Helens. Here's a photo of two men standing on the edge of one of those canyons, formed in a matter of hours. It looks like the Grand Canyon, doesn't it? In fact, it's called the Little Grand Canyon. Grand Coulee in the state of Washington was eroded due to a cataclysmic glacial dam breach in a matter of days. In fact, it's part of the scab lands of eastern Washington, which are 15,000 square miles of eroded canyons and scab lands that formed in a matter of days due to a massive water flow due to a dam breach. Grand Coulee is over 50 miles long, up to 6 miles wide and 900 feet deep. These were eroded quickly, not slowly, over millions of years of time. Grand Canyon again formed due to a unique series of circumstances. We believe that the late flood erosion was again flowing in an easterly direction and eroded that mile and a half layers of strata leaving behind the grand staircase. The Bible says that toward the end of the flood the waters rushed up by the mountains and down into the valleys. They sloshed back and forth. I think a good interpretation is that the mountains arose and the valleys sank down and the waters rushed up and back and forth as they sloshed back and forth. And as any continental drift took place, and again, I cover this in an Old Earth Global Flood teaching, what is now the North American continent stopped and crumpled, forming the Rocky Mountains, the Wasatch Mountains in Utah, and the Sierra Madres found in California. They run parallel to the coast, almost like one car rear-ended another. This diverted the easterly flowing water in a southerly direction. Now, the Grand Staircase had been left behind, and these southerly flowing waters left behind the scab lands of southern Utah and northern Arizona. Textbooks correctly teach that you can't bend rock. If you tried to be, uh, bend a piece of shale that was, let's say, 10 feet long and a foot wide and an inch thick, it wouldn't bend. It would snap. You can't bend rock. Yet we find geologic compression events like this entire mountain range with hundreds of feet of finely stratified layers, and they're, they're folded up. They're bent and squished together almost like an accordion with up to 160-degree bends in the rock. Well, how do you bend a piece of rock like this without breaking it? Because those layers are bent but not broken. The secular excuse, and that's what it is, holds that all these geologic compression events, which you see all over the world, those layers were subducted miles below the surface 
hen superheated and in their soft state as they were being put, pushed back up to the surface over millions of years of time. This one is when the folding took place and then they hardened into rock afterwards. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. The main one that I'll point out is that if you superheat these sedimentary layers of rock that were laid down by water, they metamorphose and they would be metamorphic rock. But no, they're not metamorphic. They are sedimentary layers that were laid down by water. Those were still mud layers at the end of the flood when the mountains arose and the valley sank down and they got pushed together and they folded and have hardened into rock since giving bends up to 160 degrees in rock that's not broken because they were mud when the event took place. So toward the end of the flood, the mountains arose and the valley sank down. So this is when the Kaibab upwarp formed. Toward the end of the flood, the waters had eroded the grand staircase, the mountains uplifted, and the Colorado Plateau got pushed together. There was a fault line that formed and it jutted up the Kaibab limestone, which is the rim of the canyon, in the Kaibab upwork, which is uplifted 3,500 to 4,500 feet above the Kaibab limestone on the surrounding plain. The Kaibab upwork. In fact, down in Grand Canyon, you can see many examples of folded yet not broken rock layers throughout the canyon and around the surrounding areas. Grand Canyon's formation, there are a couple of very good theories, and we weren't there to test, study, and observe it, so we can only come up with good, viable theories. One that I tend to like is that the diverted waters, when the mountains arose and the easterly flowing waters were diverted in a southerly direction toward the very end of the flood, they formed a channeling event that cut through what is now the Kaibab upward. Here's a satellite photo of Grand Canyon cutting through that upwarp. Again, the snows on the upwarp, the uplifted part. But what I believe happened, and others, uh, this is theory developed by several other good scientists, not myself, but I, I think this has a lot of validity, is that a channeling event formed coming in from the north, what is in what is now Glen and Marble Canyons, and it met up with another channeling event coming in from the northeast through the what is now the Little Colorado River Canyon. These two connected and cut through that upwarp in a channeling event at the very end of the flood, leaving behind Grand Canyon in a matter of days, not millions of years of time. If you've ever stood on a beach facing away from the water and the wave comes up and as it goes back it starts to dissipate and starts to channel, and that's a channeling event. Another a good and viable theory is that the, uh, the, the canyon formed after the flood and that the upwarp, the Kaibab upwarp, was actually a huge earthen dam that caught the runoff from the flood and runoff from the Colorado Plateau for several years after the flood. And eventually the waters breached that earthen dam because if Grand Canyon did not cut through the Kaibab upwarp, the lake's trap behind that upwarp would hold about three times the amount of water held by Lake Michigan today. Well, when water tunnels through a, a dam like the Kaibab Upwork, and whether, whether it happened in the breach dam or a channel event at the end of the flood, water cutting through such a earthen dam causes it to collapse catastrophically by a massive water and mud flow. Massive water flow leads to a lot of very damaging issues. Uh, plucking is a hydraulic lifting of large slabs of rock that were then torn up and tumbled with the flowing water. I'm talking about water flowing about 120 miles per hour. This debris would have been shooting through the forming canyon, acting like a giant belt sander as it ripped through the upwork, leaving behind the straight up and down walls of Grand Canyon that you can observe today. Massive water flow leads to what's called cavitation bubbles. Cavitation bubbles implode at almost a half a million pounds per square inch. This would turn rock to dust instantaneously. And all of these grains of sand to boulders up to 200,000 pounds are ripping through the upwork with that water forming Grand Canyon very quickly. This is a picture inside this, one of the spillways at Glen Canyon Dam. Back in 1983, they had a winter with a lot of snow and a spring with a lot of rain. And the water was rushing into Lake Powell, which is behind Glen Canyon Dam. 
So much water was coming into the lake, they were afraid the dam would collapse. So they opened all the spillways to let out as much water as possible, and the dam started to shake. Fortunately, this happened during the daytime. They rushed out on the dam, and they looked below at the spillways com coming out at the bottom of the dam. Well, the water out of one of the spillways was red. So they shut down that spillway immediately, and when they went inside to see what had happened, well, a cavitation event had taken place, and it had eaten through the three-foot steel-reinforced concrete and more than 30 feet into the bedrock below. Had they not been able to see what was taking place, that dam would likely have collapsed. And Grand Canyon would be a bit larger today than it is. Well, Marble Canyon opens abruptly to form Grand Canyon where the upwork was breached. The vertical canyon walls, uh, like the ones to the left at, at uh, Deer Creek, show throughout the canyon that they form quickly. Vertical walls are indicative of very fast formation, not slow, gradual formation. The rock debris is missing. Just like the rock debris is missing at Bryce Canyon, it's missing at Grand Canyon as well. The, the current the stories is that the canyon formed seven million years ago. This changes all the time, by the way, as you've probably noticed. But if the rock wall stood there for seven million years, rock walls collapse over time, and the canyon should be full of rock debris. The canyon is, the walls are very clean because it formed recently and quickly, not over never seen millions of years of time. So the results of modern dam failures and, and observed catastrophic aqueous events, the steep canyon sides, the lack of time gaps, the lack of rock debris, and so much more support the six-day formation of Grand Canyon. In fact, the Native Americans who live in the bottom of the canyon have a legend that the canyon formed during a great flood event. This textbook asks kids, challenge your thinking. Grand Canyon shows wide looping meanders of an old, slow-moving river. However, the walls are very steep of a fast-moving, youthful river. So how might this conflict be explained? Well, my friends, once again, Grand Canyon formed to a, to a very unique set of circumstances. Toward the end of the flood, the mountains arose and the valley sank down. And this helped form the Kaibab upwork through which the canyon cuts. The water running off, or even perhaps breached a uh, dam event after the flood, cut through that upwork, leaving behind Grand Canyon very quickly. Not, it did not form slowly over millions of years of time. So you have the steep uh, side walls from the fast moving waters. Then the Colorado River entered the already formed canyon and form the slow meandering loops that you can see in the bottom of the canyon today. This from National Geographic for Kids, a proselytizer of old earth beliefs. Geologists now think Grand Canyon grew in quick spurts from massive flooding. Over 750 million years of time, <laughs> they can't admit it happened quickly. Remember, this is one of the four pillars of secular beliefs. But Grand Canyon and the Grand Staircase are monuments to God's past and his coming judgments of man's sin. Yet this week, if you go to Grand Canyon or you read a secular textbook about it, you'll be taught over millions of years the Colorado River carved out Grand Canyon, even though the, the actual scientists and geologists that study Grand Canyon know that is not so. So why to continue to promote these billions of years beliefs through Grand Canyon? Well, it's simple, my friends. Billions of years of time sets the foundation for Darwinism. These two have combined to set the foundation for modern naturalism and for secular humanism. If they lose billions of years, Darwinism, naturalism, and secular humanism are finished. They own the system. They cannot lose their millions and billions of years of time. And a global flood destroys every old earth belief, which is why in the last days scoffers will deny that the world that was being overflowed with water perished. And I cover this in great detail in my book, It's About Time, and in my brand new book, The Cost. I cover Darwinism and Age of the Earth issues thoroughly. I cover this in our Grand Canyon Rim Tours, our one and two day trips, and in our Grand Staircase Tours, which include Bryce and Zion. 
And again, please visit our website at creationministries.org and check out some of our tours under Christian uh, Travel and Tours. From 1 Timothy 6, Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. If Old Earth beliefs that put death before Adam have been a problem for you, Check out our Old Earth Global Flood teachings, as well as this on Grand Canyon and Grand Staircase. Check out our Noah's Ark and Dinosaurs teaching, and put your faith in the Word of God. I hope our information will be of help to you in that endeavor. But Grand Canyon and Grand Staircase truly are monuments for the truth, reliability, and authority of God's non-compromised Word, word for word, and cover to cover, my friends. So let me end with this from Ephesians 4. Let's be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. My friends, put your trust in the word of God, word for word, and cover to cover. And have a great day. God bless you.